Okay, so hopefully. Yes, I can see your slide fine. You can see my slide fine. Thank you, Robbie. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> and first of all, let me begin by thanking the editors of Matter and Radiation at Extremes for the invitation to present my research as part of this uh, webinar series. So I will present an overview of my group's research into the role of uh, the relativistic plasma aperture produced in the interaction of a high power laser pulse with an ultra thin foil. And specifically, I'll talk about um, the role that plays in particle acceleration and uh, radiation generation. Just get my laser pointer running properly. Okay, so this talk includes work from several experimental campaigns. And uh, so the researchers listed here all contributed to <clears throat> various different aspects of the work that I'll present here uh, in this presentation. So this is an outline of my talk. Uh, I'll begin with a, a brief introduction to the concept of the relativistic plasma aperture and the motivation for this research. And then I'm going to move on to talk about four different uh, sets of experimental results, um, which we've obtained in recent years, uh, and, uh, and then conclude, give, conclude with uh, a little bit of a summary towards the end. Okay, so as I say, I'll begin with an introduction and, um, and really this plot of achievable laser intensity as a function of time, uh, which will be well known, of course, to many of the researchers in the audience. Uh, and it's really the introduction of chirp pulse amplification in the mid 1980s or so, which is very much a milestone for the field and led to many orders of magnitude increase in laser intensity. And that's really opening, opened up uh, new uh, avenues of exploration, including relativistic plasma physics and new topics such as uh, particle acceleration. And uh, uh, as I'm sure many in the audience will know that uh, the CPA um, was awarded with the, well, essentially the discovery of CPA uh, led to the, a share in the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics for Donna Maru, sorry, Donna Strickland and Gerard Maru. And, um, and as I say, huge increases in laser intensity as a function of time ever since. And uh, the development of multi petawatt lasers promised to result in even higher intensities in the near future. The resulting growth in the in research in this field can be visualized by the growth in high power laser facilities as shown in this IQ map. And uh, indeed it's fantastic to see uh, the growth in, in recent years uh, with some very exciting facilities coming online uh, in the near future. Okay, so many of the processes which we investigate with a high power laser pulse interaction with the plasma um, it really, it, it st all starts with the collective motion of the plasma electrons in response to the laser light. The electrons within the plasma can, of course, they're light and they can respond on the time scale of the laser pulse. And it's really their displacement that sets up the field within the plasma and induces uh, radiation generation. And so whether we look at the case of an underdense plasma, so here we're plotting, uh, if you like, some examples from left to right here is increasing intensity, uh, sorry, increasing density of our plasma. So whether we look at the case of an underdense plasma where we have uh, laser wake field acceleration, for example, or we look at the case of a near critical density where the laser pulse uh, is um, strongly coupled and directly accelerating uh, electrons to produce beams of energetic electrons uh, through direct acceleration, or whether we look at uh, an over, the case of an overdense plasma in which the laser light gets absorbed near the front of the target, but still fields are generated, electrons are injected from the front. In all of these scenarios, it, everything starts here with the laser energy coupling to electrons, and then subsequently the electrons producing fields uh, and producing radiation and particle acceleration. So that's the first aspect of this. The second aspect, of course, comes from the fact that this is a true interaction. And by that, I mean 
Um, not only does the laser pulse result in electron motion, but the electron motion uh, results in changes to the plasma refractive index, which in turn uh, affects the propagating laser light. Uh, and so therefore we also have relativistic plasma optical uh, phenomena. And so really both sets of these phenomena, particle and radiation emission, as well as the potential for relativistic plasma optics or relativistic plasma photonics, uh, is really motivating a lot of the, the, the research in this, in this area. So for the purposes of this talk, there are really two relativistic optical effects that I want to mention. Um, that's important for understanding much of the research that I'll present in, in my slides. The first is relativistic self-focusing. Uh, and so this occurs because the spatial profile of the, due to the spatial profile of the, uh, the intensity of the laser light at the focus. And so for example, you've got the peak of the intensity on axis here, uh, such that you have the maximum and the electron Lorentz factor, the, the electrons in the region of the peak of the laser light are, are oscillating greatest. They, they get the largest Lorentz factor on axis. And then as you move off axis with increasing radius, you have a decrease in the intensity, of course. Uh, and so you end up with a radial variation in the refractive index. And that effectively gives rise to uh, self-focusing. Uh, so you can see the curvature in the phase front as the laser pulse uh, propagates within the plasma. So that's the first, uh, first process to be aware of. The second one is relativistic induced transparency. Uh, and so this really comes about from the relativistic increase in the electron mass as the electrons respond and oscillate in the laser field. So that increase in the uh, Lorentz factor of the electrons effectively decreases the plasma frequency. And so you, you see here plotted as the dispersion relation governing laser light propagation. Uh, and effectively in the case of a, a dense plasma, you, you may well start off with a plasma that starts off, which starts off dense, it's over dense. And so the plasma frequency is above the laser frequency. But then at some point in the interaction, due to the relativistic increase in the electron mass, you get this decrease in plasma frequency, such that it drops below the laser frequency. And when that occurs, we, we speak of the uh, plasma becoming relativistically transparent. So this is the process of relativistic induced transparency. And this is important for, for, the, for all of the, the work that I present in, in this talk. So two very basic uh, processes, but nonetheless important for, for the physics, which I'm going to cover here. I've included this slide because it summarizes uh, the key laser driven ion acceleration mechanisms, which really motivate studies of collective motion of electrons in dense plasma. Uh, and really here, the different uh, ion acceleration mechanisms as shown in these colored blobs are shown here on this laser intensity uh, plasma density parameter space. Uh, and one thing to note here is this dashed black line, which is effectively the near critical density regime, which separates the transparent plasma. So everything to the top left hand side of this uh, plot uh, is a plasma in which the uh, plasma frequency is lower than the laser frequency, the laser light can be transmitted, so it's effectively transparent plasma. Everything to the bottom right uh, is um, dense plasma, so plasma frequency greater than laser frequency. So uh, you can see there's a number of different processes, ion acceleration processes occurring. Uh, they're shown by these uh, simple schematics. And from that, you can see that there are schemes in which the moving electric field, for example, induced by a shock as a laser propagates uh, into a, an underdense plasma. Um, that establishes fields which propagate forward and that um, can give rise to shock acceleration of ions. And on the other side of this, typically we have fields building up on the surfaces of our plasma. So typically this will be a thin foil target or a solid density target. 
and uh, the fields build up on the surface and you get a sheath field uh, acceleration process. And then in between here, as we move closer to this dashed black line, as we go up in intensity, you have the laser uh, radiation pressure really begins to exceed that of the thermal pressure of the plasma. And so the critical surface is driven inward. And so the laser starts boring into the, the target. And this is a process called radiation pressure acceleration. And then the one that's of particular interest for this talk is a process called, uh, well, essentially relativistic um, uh, enhancement of ion acceleration or breakout after burner acceleration uh, in which the target becomes relativistically transparent at some point in the interaction. And then you have the laser light propagating through the target, enhancing uh, the uh, electric fields. The, region, the reason that's of particular interest is that some of the highest energy laser accelerated protons have been measured uh, exactly in this regime. Um, and so, for example, uh, here are some example measurements, which we, we published a couple of years back in, a, in this paper down here. Maximum proton energy is a function of target thickness as measured using the Vulcan laser at the Rutherford Laboratory. And essentially what we find is when we have fairly thick targets, we're getting TNSA acceleration. Uh, as we start to thin the target down, we're, we're getting more uh, signature of radiation pressure acceleration occurring. But for a certain optimum thickness, we're getting transparency occurring through the target at around about the peak of the interaction. And when that occurs, you're getting a, an enhancement in the ion energies. Uh, and so this has really motivated a lot of our work in this field was to try to understand the underpinning physics of relativistic induced transparency in ultra thin foils so that we could optimize processes such as um, ion acceleration from these ultra thin foils. Okay, so it's really in this regime, uh, the target starts off opaque, it starts off in, uh, with an ultra thin foil and it becomes relativistic induced, uh, relativistically transparent. And really there are two processes going on uh, here uh, at the sort of intensities we can achieve at the moment in order to achieve uh, the transparency. So for example, uh, here we see some simulation results of uh, electron density. So these are results from a 2D PIC simulation with the EPOC code. Um, corresponding to some of our experimental conditions, but essentially what you see plotted in blue is the peak electron uh, density on axis. It's actually the ratio of the electron density to the critical density, but it's the peak electron density on axis. The red is the uh, Lorentz factor of the electrons. And uh, you can see what's happening here as, as the, and, and this is plotted as a function of the temporal evolution of the laser pulse. So it's about a 40 femtosecond for with half maximum laser pulse. So early on in the interaction, you've got a solid density target. The electrons start heating. So you can see the increase in the Lorentz factor. You start to get expansion of the electron population. So the blue curve starts to come down here. And it's really the combination of both of those two that gives rise to transparency. So the Plasma frequency, of course, decreases because of the decrease in the, in the uh, electron density. But it also, you get this relativistic correction to the plasma frequency, which we talked about before, which decreases the, which decreases the plasma frequency because of the increase in gamma factor, the Lorentz factor. And at some point when these two cross over, you get relativistic transparency occurring. And you can see here the transmitted laser light, which is shown in green, so very quickly you get a, a fast turn on of the transmitted light and the remainder of the laser light gets transmitted through the target. So typically in terms of ion acceleration, uh, in these ultra thin foils, we go through a, a range of different processes, starting with sheath acceleration. We may have a phase with lasers boring into the target, radiation pressure acceleration. And then when the target becomes transparent, you've got transparency enhancement of the, uh, of the fields. Now, an important point to note here is that the whole target doesn't become relativistically transparent. And in fact, it's really only a region of the target uh, close to the, the peak of the, the, the laser uh, intensity profile. So if we take here a 
and it's a schematic of a of a of a laser focus. Um, and if you consider that it's only above a certain threshold intensity that the target will become relativistically transparent, then for a good focal, a good quality focal spot, that corresponds to a circular region, okay, a circular region above which the the intensity is high enough to induce transparency. Uh, and so when you think about that, when that laser pulse is focused onto uh, front of our target or focused onto our target, it's really only uh, a region at the very center where the target becomes relativistically transparent. And so that effectively gives rise to what we call a relativistic plasma aperture. And so this was a term that we introduced in this paper in Nature Physics in, in 2016. Um, and so it corresponds to a condition where the, where the target is classically opaque, still in the, in the center here on axis, but it's relativistically transparent. Um, and it's really only transparent over a region corresponding to an aperture. And so a lot of, um, pretty much all of the, what I'm going to present in the remainder of this talk is how the laser pulse interacts with the plasma in the region of this aperture how it propagates through that aperture and how it affects the acceleration, particle acceleration and field generation, radiation generation in and around the region of that, uh, of that aperture. And just before I start on the, on the main part, let me also mention that um, as we increase laser pulse duration, we get a departure away from that clean aperture. So these are all epoch simulations. Um, and you can see the intensity here, 5 times 10 to 20 watt per square centimeter. What you're looking at here is electron density plot. You can see very little expansion in the case of a short pulse, much more longitudinal plasma expansion as we increase the duration of the pulse. And then as we increase to very long durations of the order of 100 to femtoseconds, you, can, you, you actually have laser pulse propagating over quite an extended plasma. And so that changes the interaction dynamics quite a bit away from this relativistic plasma aperture and more towards a direct acceleration of electrons. We still get an aperture, but it's not a cleanly formed aperture. And moreover, we get processes such as uh, direct acceleration of electrons over that extended plasma region, giving rise to a, a jet of uh, energetic, energetic electrons. So the interaction physics changes quite a bit depending on the pulse duration. Okay, so that was my introduction to the concept of the relativistic plasma aperture and the motivation for this research. I want to talk about some of, uh, some of the original work we did and then bring you up to date on our recent work in this area. Okay, so much, for much of the work that we've done experimentally, we've used both the Vulcan and Gemini high power lasers at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the UK. Uh, and most of the work I'm gonna present in this talk was actually done using the Gemini laser, the shorter pulse laser. Uh, so Vulcan delivers pulses of the order of hundreds of femtoseconds, up to a bit of picosecond in the short pulse scenario. Um, Gemini delivers pulses of the order of tens of femtoseconds, typically of the order of 30 or 40 femtoseconds. It's a titanium sapphire based system, of course, uh, and uh, you can see some of the other parameters listed here. Importantly, actually, both achieve similar intensities, mid 10 to 20 watt per square centimeter up to 10 to 21 watt per square centimeter, which allows us also to do direct comparison between uh, the long pulse drive and the short pulse drive. But as I say, for most of the work I'm going to present here, it will be done with a short pulse Gemini system. So the setup we used varies a bit depending on the focus of a particular experiment, but typically it involves a double plasma mirror system to really enhance the intensity contrast, the temporal intensity contrast of the laser pulses. Again, we need that when we're dealing with ultra thin foils, so we don't get pre-expansion of the foil. Um, and then typically we will use a, a half wave plate and quarter wave plate on translation slides, both trans, uh, translation and rotational slides, so that we can drive in and out different wave plates 
and to change the polarization of the, uh, of the laser pulse. Laser pulse is then focused onto a target position here, and we use a range of diagnostics to, to, to measure, for example, the spatial and uh, uh, energy profile of the, uh, of the proton beam, for example, using radiochromic film, of the electron beam using an uh, image plate, uh, we'll also measure the transmission of the laser light through the target. We measure the, the back reflected light, the spectral properties of that. And we also measure the spectral and uh, polarization properties of the transmitted laser light. And so we do that using a polarimetry diagnostic, which you'll see more about in a few, in a few slides. Uh, also using frequency resolved optical gating frog or GNU diagnostic and uh, optical uh, spectrometers. Okay, so our first results really in this field uh, were date back to about 2016 or so, um, um, <clears throat> when we measured the spatial and energy distribution of the beams of energetic electrons accelerated from, from our target foil uh, when it was undergoing uh, induced transparency. We found some very interesting, these are experimental measurements at the top here, just some example slides. You can find many more of these examples in, in the original paper. But uh, I choose these because it kind of summarizes nicely the sort of structures we were, we were observing. And what we found is with linear polarization, we were getting a double lobe structure, very similar to what we were seeing in our simulations. Uh, when we went to circular polarization, it be was becoming more circular, like in, in, in terms of the lobes, in terms of the overall structure. And then for ellip uh, elliptical polarization, it was somewhere in between. And in fact, we could rotate and twist the uh, double lobe structures by changing the degree of ellipticity in the polarization of the drive laser pulse. So this, we became very interested in this as a control mechanism for the uh, energetic electrons that we are producing in these dense plasmas, ultra thin foils, but nonetheless dense plasma as a laser pulse is propagating through. And so we explained the double lobe structure in terms of the diffraction of the laser light as it propagates through the aperture you're getting intense uh, lobes of laser light, which are expelling uh, uh, electrons either side and building up these uh, electron distributions either side. In the same paper, we showed numerically that um, the measured changes to the electron beam distributions uh, are induced by the rotating polarization vector. Uh, and essentially, we find that depending on the degree of ellipticity in the polarization of the drive laser beam, the electron lobe structure was either static or rotating. Uh, it was static in the case of uh, linear polarization. It was rotating at a constant velocity in the case of circular polarization. Okay, so these double lobe structure could be made to rotate constant velocity. When we drove it with circular polarization, and when we drove it with elliptical polarization, we could induce a variation in the rotational frequency of, of this lobe structure. So it makes for a very interesting uh, dynamic of, of the electron distribution in the, in the plane of the target. And of course, as the, as the laser pulse continues to propagate through the target, um, if you, for example, driving this with circular polarization, you can uh, effectively induce a helical-like structure or helical structure of, of the jet of plasma electrons, which are induced. And so it makes for very interesting uh, uh, properties of electron beams. We also showed in a follow-up paper that the modulation in the electron distribution uh, leads to modulation in the longitudinal uh, uh, electric field is generated. So you can see here these modulations are mapped into the into the longitudinal field. Uh, and that field, of course, is responsible for ion acceleration. And we also see in the simulation that that's then subsequently mapped into the ion beam. And so in our simulation, we were able to produce these striped proton beams or ring-like ring distributions of proton beams and, and, and change that depending on the polarization drive of the laser radiation. Experimentally, we, we did see structures which bro are broadly similar, 
to the to simulations and uh, not as nice as these larger aperture simulations that we had up here but nonetheless we were able to see double low black structures in the case of uh, linear polarization and we were able to see um, ring-like structures in the case of circular polarization which give which were very similar to the the coupled simulations for the for the parameters of our experiment and give an indication that um, that the that this sort of that the structure is being clearly mapped into the proton beam. So this really points to the importance of understanding the evolution of the plasma dynamics when this when this uh, relativistic plasma aperture is produced, because it not only affects the uh, electrons that are accelerated, but also uh, also the ion beams. Uh, incidentally, we also proposed in that same early work, we proposed the use of the helical plasma jets as a possible analogue of astrophysical jets created by an accretion disk. So that's, of course, rotating due to gravitational effects. And as it rotates, you're, you're getting this uh, helical magnetic field and you're getting the scenario in which the pitch of that field varies as you move out from the source of the rotation. We see something very, very similar in our uh, simulations when we have the when we're driving the, the aperture with a with circularly polarized light. We're getting the helical uh, electro, electron distribution, and uh, that's due to inverse uh, Faraday rotation that's giving rise to uh, this strong magnetic field with a helic with a, a pitch that varies as we change as we move out away from the target surface. And these are very, very strong fields of, of the order of 10 or up to about 10 uh, kilotesla. So it gives you an idea of, um, of, of, of the sort of field strength. But the indication here is that potentially one could look to do um, simulating in the laboratory astrophysical type, astrophysical jet uh, scenarios. Okay, so I'm gonna move on here to talk about the Diagnosing the onset of time of relativistic induced transparency. This is more recent work that we've been we've been doing. So as you can guess from this, that we've we've moved on from looking at the particle dynamics to looking at the properties of the transmitted and generated uh, light within the plasma. And we do this by collecting the uh, the light that see that's generated or, or transmitted through the plasma, we do that by using a second um, uh, off-axis parabola, collimating that light, and then picking off some of the light and sending it to different diagnostics. So, for example, a Grunui or a, or an optical spectrometer. And what we showed in this uh, paper in Physical Review applied last year is that we detect or we measure fringes. In, um, in the case of ultra thin foil. Um, so you can see that both in the optical spectrometer where, where we see uh, very clear fringes forming in, 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 on, in the optical spectrum, but also for the same shots, we, we're measuring it on the, with the Grunui diagnostic. Um, these are just some example images, of course. There are many more. Uh, you, you can read up more about this work in this uh, Physical Review Applied paper. But just to summarize this, effectively, we find in the case where we have no target, okay, so this is a reference case without a target, we're just measuring the frequency resolved um, of, of the laser pulse. And you can see, you see that here. Then we have a, a micron thick target where we're not getting any transparency, we're just getting coherent transition radiation being generated. And you can see the distribution in the middle here. Uh, and that's only when we have very thin foils that we're seeing these fringes. And that's um, what you can see here uh, in, in this in image on the, uh, on the right hand side. Um, so the fact that we measure fringes means that there are effectively two pulses in the detected light that, that, um, that is making its way to the diagnostic. The first of the, these pulses comes from the coherent transition radiation that's produced by the electrons, which is uh, injected into the, into the foil over the course of the interactions. These are constantly being injected depending one omega or two omega, depending on the 
the absorption processes at the front of the target, um, and those will produce coherent transition radiation um, at, at the rear of the target. We're also then getting some degree of transmission of the laser light at a, at a critical point in the interaction. So you can see this effectively sketched out here, a CTR being emitted over the course of the interaction and then transition, sorry, not th uh, transmission occurring at some critical point. And it's really the interference between the optical light produced by CTR and the, uh, the transmission of the light through the target that gives rise to, uh, to, to the uh, modulations in the optical spectrum. So experimentally, we measure peak corresponding to the uh, coherent transition radiation. And then we also measure a second peak, which is very, very sensitive to the degree of laser light transmitted through the target. Uh, and so it can be controlled, for example, by changing the target thickness or by controlling the laser intensity such that we're effectively controlling the, temp the time over at which relativistic transparency occurs and therefore the amount of light is transmitted through the target. And uh, as I say, these two interfere and you end up with this, this fringe pattern. So the nice thing about this is that by measuring the fringe separation, one can uh, work backwards to determine the, the time at which the target becomes transparency, uh, it becomes transparent. And so one can use that as a diagnostic of the onset of uh, relativistic induced transparency. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next topic here, which is high power light emission with tunable modes uh, uh, or high order transverse modes effectively. Um, and so really, how did this come about? Well, effectively, we were interested in measuring the effect of the transparency on laser polarization. So we wanted to know whether the near critical density plasmas that we were producing when the thin foil expanded, whether this would change the polarization properties of the transmitted light. And really, the motivation for the study came from uh, an earlier paper by, uh, by Stark and co-workers in 2015 where they showed, this was a paper as, uh, focusing, it was, it's a paper on, on numerical and the, uh, theoretical study, which focused on um, the anisotropic electron heating within a near critical density plasma. And basically they, they indicated in this work that the, that the heating along the two different axes in the case of a linearly polarized pulse, uh, the heating along the two different orthogonal axes differs to the point that you have a, a, a correction to the, the critical plasma, a local correction to the critical uh, density uh, along the, the two orthogonal axes. And therefore, you, uh, effectively, your plasma starts acting as a, as, as a plasma wave plate. Uh, and in this work, you can see here that one of the uh, components of the electric field is extinguished as the laser pulse propagated through this near critical density plasma. So that work involved quite thick targets of the order of 10, um, 10 microns or so and, and a fairly uniform near critical density uh, target. Our scenario is a bit different in the sense we're starting off with ultra thin foils, they are expanding to near critical densities and they are, will expand out uh, of the order of, of microns, but the there will be longitudinal and radial variations in the density profile. And so it's not quite the same scenario, but nonetheless, we set out to determine whether there was any change in the polarization of the laser light that gets transmitted through the target in this, uh, in this scenario. Okay, so to explore this experimentally, we measured the polarization properties of the transmitted light, and uh, I've already presented this slide on the, on the you know, measurements with the optical spectrometer in the Grenouille, but uh, we also took that, the remainder of that beam and we measured the polarization properties along different axes, including the degree of circularity in the polarization uh, by inserting a, a quarter wave plate. And so using this polarimetry diagnostic, we effectively get the intensity of the light in, in, in these um, and these components effectively that make up the Stokes factors, the Stokes parameters, I should say. 
Um, and so this is just a quick schematic of the, of the diagnostic. You can read more details in this paper in scientific reports. But the important point here is that it allows us to, to, to measure the, the polarization of the, of the light. Um, so effectively, by measuring the Stokes parameters, we find that there's a change in the angle of linear polarization of the light detected at the rear of our target. There's quite a lot of information on the slide, so I'll just talk you through the, the main details here. On the left-hand side, you can see the amount of light detected as a function of the, um, the incident light. Uh, it's a normalized incident light, I should say, as a function of target thickness. And uh, not surprisingly, as we decrease the target thickness, we see an increase in the degree of transmission through the target and therefore we're detecting a larger amount of uh, light at the back of our target. We see that both experimentally, which is the black points here, and in our simulations, uh, 3D PIC simulations, which are shown here in red. Um, but what is of interest directly from, from point of view of this slide is the change in the angle, uh, angle of linear polarization of the light that we detect. Uh, effectively, what we find is that there's a, the largest change is, you know, the order of 30 to 5 or 40 degrees occurs when there's very little light transmitted through the target. Um, and when there's a, a reasonable amount of light transmitted of the order of 10 or more percent, uh, there's really no change in the polarization. So in other words, for, for very thin targets where you're getting quite a bit of light transmission, we see no change in polarization, um, but quite a significant change uh, when we get to, when we are dealing with an optimum range of target thicknesses where we're we're just getting um, you know a few percent of the laser light being transmitted. And by measurement of the Stokes parameter in the outer plane, by the way, we can determine that it's not a depolarization. It, it, it is a effectively a change in the angle of linear polarization in the plane of the target. So what's giving rise to that change? Well, uh, we did quite a lot of detailed PIC simulations using the EPOC code. And, that we find, and what we find is that the change in polarization is really produced by the generation of higher order spatial modes of intense light when the target becomes relativistically transparent. So in the case of a thick target or relatively thick target, fast electrons are being injected at the front of the target and in one omega or two omega bunches, depending on the, uh, the absorption mechanism. And that will give rise to transition radiation at the back of the target and in, in symmetrical distributions. So that's been well, well studied. In the case of an ultra thin foil where the target produces a relativistic plasma aperture, we have quite a different scenario um, when we're driving up with linearly polarized light because what's happening effectively is that the electrons are predominantly being accelerated in bunches at the edges of the target and at two poles either side of the, you know, along the laser uh, polarization vector. So what we effectively have here is that um, you're getting these arc-like distributions of electrons uh, where you have quite a, 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 an intense region of electron emission uh, either, at either pole. And at each pole, they're separated. The electron bunches are separated by the laser uh, wavelength and they're, they're bunched at the fre laser frequency. Uh, the same down here, but the overall bunching is at, at two omega, okay? Uh, twice the laser frequency. And so effectively, due to the asymmetry in the electron distributions, uh, those are actually driving radiation production in these higher order modes, higher order spatial modes. And so we can see that in our 3D particle cell simulation, uh, our input pulse, here we're starting off with an ultra thin foil, uh, a uniform foil to begin with. We start off with the uh, laser electric field, uh, laser uh, polarized in the Y, directions, this is the electric field in Y at all points. Uh, this is the electric field in Z, and so you can see no, uh, no field here at all, so it's perfectly polarized in Y. Uh, 
Then that interacts with the target and you can see the distribution uh, at the output. We're getting a very clear TEM11 structure forming um, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the light detected at the back of the target. We're also getting the TEM00 mode, which is the transmitted light through the target. But the important point is we're getting both of those two uh, in our simulations. Uh, incidentally, we've also done uh, simplified exp um, uh, simulations where we start off with a, a target with a preformed aperture. Uh, this is a one micron thick foil, so quite a thick foil with an aperture. So if we could really simplify the simulation and look at the process by which uh, these higher order spatial modes are generated. And again, here by plotting out the, uh, the bunches of electrons, this, this is the contours, the, the uh, critical density contours. You can see that electrons are being injected at the edges of the target in one omega bunches at the edges with an overall distribution to two omega. And those are producing uh, these higher order spatial modes of, uh, of, of light. Um, more details of this you'll find in this uh, paper in scientific reports uh, last year. So what we believe is happening here and what our simulations are showing what's happening here is effectively we're getting a summation of the light field from the laser light that's transmitted through the target and the light that's generated in the target and the summation of these two light fields effectively gives rise to the change in the polarization of the detected light. Uh, and so hence we're getting this, uh, this polarization shift. Um, I think I'll have to speed up just a little bit because I, I can see that um, I'm a little bit later than I thought I would be. But let me just say very briefly that we also see this in two omega. And I won't go into the details of this, except to say that um, it's tunable in terms of target thickness. We can tune from a, you know, a, a one zero mode through to, you know, a radial type distribution, from a double lobe structure through to a radially, uh, a radial uh, distribution, depending on the degree of transmission of light through the target, and therefore the ratio of the electric fields in the two, um, in the two plane, in the, in the y direction and in the z direction. So I'll just leave that at that point. I will just briefly mention that other groups are now starting to look at this. There was a paper uh, published in Fizzer of Letter, just a very recent paper by, uh, by Yi. You can see the reference here, uh, where, which really demonstrates that not only do you get the first and second harmonics, but you also get higher order harmonics when you drive this with a circularly polarized pulse, something we also saw but hadn't yet published. But uh, this paper demonstrates that you see this in, in higher order, you see higher order modes. And moreover, that those, uh, the superposition of, of the diffracting harmonics give rise to these or generate um, radiation in these orbital uh, beam, beams with orbital angular momentum. And you can see that very clearly in the two omega, the three omega, and the four omega, for example, plots. I refer you to this paper in Fizzerev letter for, for more details of that. But it, it's, it's very interesting from the point of view of, uh, of, of, of electron beam control and radiation generation in, the, in these sources. Uh, incidentally, our own simulations also show these or beams of orbital angular momentum, again, when driving it with circularly polarized light. But, um, but I'll, not, I'll, not, uh, I'll skip past the detail of that just to move on to the final sections of the talk. And I'll also mention just in passing that there was also another very recent paper, it's on the archive at the moment, uh, which also uses this relativistic plasma aperture, uh, aperture concept, but uses it for laser intensity enhancement. And so the idea here is that as the laser propagates through the, the aperture, you get a superposition of generated harmonics, which can give rise to an intensity enhancement of the order of, well, factors of between 2.5 and 3 uh, were, were modeled in, in this theory paper. These last, these last two piece, uh, pieces of work that I'm referring to are, are simulation and, and theory.
Okay, so very, very briefly on terms of other processes which can occur here. Um, I'm just going to mention briefly this role of self-focusing. Uh, I think it's important just to give you this overall picture. I don't want to leave you with the concept that uh, we've got great control on the on the plasma dynamics. I would say this everything I've talked about so far only works in the case we've got very high quality fo uh, focal spot in your laser drive, and you've got very uh, you know a very good contrast in your laser beam and so on. And we're starting with a short pulse. When I showed this set of simulation results earlier in the talk, I mentioned that the degree of plasma expansion increases as you increase the duration of the laser pulse. And the reason I wanted to come back to that is because it completely changes the nature of the aperture that's formed and the nature of the interaction physics. And so we've been exploring that um, with the Vulcan laser because the Vulcan beam delivers hundreds of femtosecond pulses uh, up to a bit, of, a, a bit of picosecond or so. Uh, well, it can deliver more, but, but, but high intensity, we've studied this with pulses up to a bit of picosecond or so. And you can see the other pulse parameters listed here. I'm not going to go into, go into the detail. I did mention the motivation for this before, so I'll not mention it again. Just to remind you, part of the motivation was to, in, well, to, to investigate ion acceleration in this regime and to see if we could increase the laser intensity and what that would do to the ion acceleration. So far, we were investigating a physics in Vulcan with these high energy near 100 MeV energies where that was driven by F3 focusing. So we wanted to increase the, the intensity from mid 10 to 20 up to about mid 10 to 21. And so we developed focusing plasma optics to take us down to an F1 focusing geometry. We deployed that on Vulcan, uh, very successfully deployed the optic. But what we found was that the proton beam didn't go up in energy. It, and in fact, it decreased in energy a little bit because we were getting less energy within the focal spot. But the important thing, I don't have time to go into detail of this, it's an entirely separate talk in its own right, except to say that um, what we found is that when we're dealing with F3 focusing, even though the nominal intensity was lower the nominal intensity with F1 focusing, we believe that the actual intensity was higher because effectively, because of the degree of self-focusing that's occurring as a laser pulse propagates through the aperture. And we can see that self-focusing occurring in our simulations. You can see a signature of that in this uh, electron density plot. Um, and just to, yeah, just to conclude that, I'll just say that even when we move from 40 femtoseconds up to about 200 femtoseconds. Already, you can start to see that strong self-focusing can occur when your plasma is expanding out, you know, of the order of 10, 20, 20 microns or so. Uh, okay, so, so I guess the takeaway message from this part of the talk was that the many of the features that I've talked about, the high harmonic generation, the, the control of the plasma dynamics, the orbital angular momentum and so on, are all produced nicely when you get very short pulses. But the moment you start stretching the pulse and getting a larger plasma expansion, you start to lose some of that. So I'm going to really going to finish with this slide. Um, it is uh, more or less a, su a quick summary of the main uh, points in the talk, and I'll just run through very, very quickly. I started the talk with a, an introduction to the relativistic plasma aperture. In fact, it's produced in an ultra-thin foil and, um, and then talked about some of our early work in terms of polarization control of the plasma dynamics. It was changing the electron beam structure by producing those helical distributions um, and the sort of magnetic fields that one gets. I talked about how that's mapped into the proton beam. In fact, that we get spatial intensity profiles in a proton beam, either lobe-like structures or ring-like structures, which we can directly correlate back to the electron dynamics induced by the plasma aperture. I then talked about the transition radiation and the fact that the interference between the light that's produced and the light that's transmitted gives rise to these fringes, and we can use those fringes as a diagnostic of the onset time of transparency. I talked about the the effect of polarization change and the 
and how that's produced by the summation of light fields, both the light that's transmitted and the light that's generated. And, and then towards the end, we talked about what happens when you deal with a, lar a longer pulse where you've other processes such as self-focusing coming into play and you're getting direct acceleration of electrons through the extended uh, interaction of, as the laser propagates through the extended uh, plasma. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to take any, any questions you have. Okay, well, thank you very much, Paul. That was a fascinating talk. Um, so now, if we have any questions, the way we do this is that um, you raise your hand, which you just, there's a button at the bottom of the screen, it should allow you to raise your hand, and then I'll unmute you and you can ask your question in person. So please, if anyone's got a question, just raise your hand. Yes, we have Vladimir Tikonchuk. I will just allow him to talk. Okay. Thank yep. you. Can you hear you? Are you hear me? Yep. We hear you. Thanks, thanks, Vladimir. We hear you. Very, very nice talk. It's nice manipulation of the light and the hole created in the plasma. So my question is to the slide 22, when you show the simulations with the helicoidal magnetic field generated uh, from rotation of the polarization. Yes. Uh, what particles are doing in this situation? Do they also fall in some kind of helis or they are more or less straight, for, straight trajectories because magnetic field is quite strong? The, mag the magnetic field is quite strong. These, the, the field is effectively generated by the fact that the particles are rotating. So the, the double lobe structure of electrons, I don't have the, the, the exact plot corresponding to this, uh, to, to this distribution you see on the, on the slide, mm -hmm. but the double lobe structure of electrons are rotating in response to the circular polarization of the, of the laser light. Mm -hmm. so this, that rotating electron distribution, that double lobe structure that's rotating, that's driving, driving the magnetic field distribution that you, that you see there. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah, but thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, yes, we have another question here from Ongbo Kai. I will just allow you to talk. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we do. Okay. My question is uh, why the intensity of CTR is stronger than the laser transmission? Have you checked the single of the laser transmission? like the frequency. Yes, so we, it, it's only stronger when we have a scenario. Let me see if I can find Yes, yes, here. On, yes, on. Uh, where, which one should I look for? Oh, it's, 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 only, it's only stronger when we have a scenario that, um, that the target is at a, at, at a certain thickness. So effectively, the, uh, for, so for example, the change in the polarization we see is, is, uh, max is maximized when we have very little laser light being transmitted through the target. And in fact, it's, it's only at that scenario that the degree of laser light is, is more or less equivalent to the light that's generated, yeah? The, th the radiation is generated. And so the radiation, is, that indicates, the fact that we see largest polarization shift there uh, is an indication that the that the light that's generated uh, is, is something like a, a, a percent or a few percent of the of, of the overall uh, light in the, in the laser pulse. Yes. Okay. So the, the point is when we have a scenario where quite a lot of laser light is transmitted, and then very easily we get that when we make our target just a little bit thinner, we get a lot of laser light uh, very quickly being transmitted through the target, and when that occurs the change in the polarization effectively switches off again. Does that make sense? Because, because it's dominated by the light that's transmitted through the target. So in that sense, the, the, the laser light, trans, the, so the laser light generated is much weaker than the light uh, that can be transmitted through the target when we deal with an ultra thin foil. But if we choose carefully the thickness of our foil so that we time 
the onset of transparency. So only a small percentage of the laser light gets transmitted. So that scenario that we have a, an equivalent in the light fields and therefore change in, in the polarization. Okay. Or an effect, I should say an effective change in the polarization. Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Great. So we have a, another question in the chat. It says, thank you for your impressive talk. Is the relativistic aperture mechanism for generating new model light sensitive to the target thickness? Uh, oh, yes, it is. Um, so effectively, uh, very much so. And maybe, maybe the easiest way is just to point to this, this slide here. I mean, of course, once we get to thicker targets, we, we get very little light or no light, of course, when you get to very thick target transmitted through, through, the, through the foil. Uh, we start with a, with, a, um, with, with a very small aperture at, at the center, of course. Uh, when we get to a certain target thickness, then as we decrease the target thickness more. So effectively what's happening here is that the, the target is decompressing. Okay, so it's not purely relativistic induced transparency. It's a combination of relativistic transparency and the decompression of the target. And so as we start off with a thinner and thinner target, we get a quicker decompression of the target. And therefore the aperture forms more readily and faster. And so therefore one does need to choose very carefully the range of target thicknesses to get that aperture forming. Great. And now we have another question from uh, Kay Lan. Okay. Thank you. Very nice. A uh, very interesting talk. So I have uh, maybe two naive questions. So first, uh, the pulse duration is very important in generating the plasma aperture, as I understand from you. Yes. So what's the main factors which decide the best um, pulse duration? Is that connected with the laser intensity or not? Um. Okay, so, so what affects it in, in an experiment, of course, is, is largely the laser driver we use. I mean, I, I mentioned, I don't know if I've got the slide of, have I got the, the I don't have the two laser pictures here. Oh, here, here I do. So for example, the, the Vulcan laser uh, is, is one architecture is based on neodymium uh, doped glass. So that delivers, uh, the bandwidth of that means that we can get pulse durations of the order of 500 femtoseconds or of that order. And so we can work with pulse durations of 500 femtoseconds and, and above with the Vulcan laser. With the uh, Gemini laser, so titanium sapphire laser, uh, and the bandwidth allows us to get down to uh, tens of femtoseconds. And so, and of course we can stretch the pulse. So we can make that bigger. We can go to hundreds of femtoseconds with the, with the Gemini laser as well. But in doing so, of course, as we stretch the pulse, we decrease the intensity. So there's always a trade-off there between choosing, you know, we have to get a certain, above a certain intensity in order to get that aperture forming and forming nicely within the, within the, uh, within the thin foil. Uh, but there's a certain window of intensities in which we can do that. And therefore, we can change the, the pulse duration so that we stay within that window of intensities and, and are able to vary the pulse duration. Okay, thank you very much. So then it comes to a, um, how say, open time. I mean, because there is a plasma expansion, so the plasma aperture should have a limited open time. So what's the time scale of the open time? Uh, I think maybe it's uh, similar as the pulse duration or then the second question, oh, then um, um, how to make the open time, is that possible to make the open time longer or not? So, yes. yeah, yeah. After, then there is the open time, yeah. Yes, so if this was driven purely by relativistic transparency, then you're, you're quite right, because effectively, if, if it was driven by relativistic transparency and there's no expansion of the target, then you're quite right. In other words, the gamma factor would increase, the Lorentz factor increases and then decreases again. And you might think of the, the aperture opening and closing, like a shutter, right? Uh, okay. However, what we find in, in, under the, scenar uh, the scenario that we have here is that you're getting, you're getting heating of electrons and 
the, the electron population is expanding. And so what's happening effectively is that the electron density on X is, is, is continuously decreasing. And so effectively that aperture is staying open for that reason, you know? And so later on, of course, when the laser pulse is, is, is gone, you know, you get, it becomes classically transparent, yeah? Okay, yeah, I see. Thank you. Okay, thank you.